So I want to talk about two torsion in class groups of number fields. So everything I'm going to say today is uh, joint work with uh, Dante Bonolis. Okay, so uh, I'll start with an introduction. So what's the setting? So uh, let's say we have a number field K. So I'm going to let DK be its discriminant. I'm going to let uh, CLK be its uh, class group. And for any prime number P, I'm going to let the CLK uh, brackets P be the P torsion subgroup of CLK. All right, and uh, here is a classical problem. <clears throat> Given two integers, n at least two, and p a prime number, uh, people are interested in bounding the size of the subgroup CLK uh, brackets p, so the p torsion subgroup of CLK, for instance, in terms of the discriminant of k, but could be something else depending on k, uh, as k runs over number fields of uh, degree n. So the degree is fixed, uh, the prime p is fixed. And we view the, uh, these two integers as being fixed. So it means that when we will have bounds for the p torsion subgroup of the class group of K, we will have constants which will depend on these two integers. And we will not care about these two, uh, about these uh, constants. Okay. All right. So uh, here is a classical theorem. So it's due to Landau. So for any n at least two, and any epsilon positive for any number field k of fixed degree n, then the class group of k is uh, bounded above by uh, roughly the square root of the discriminant, okay, of the absolute value of the discriminant. And there is a constant hidden in this notation. So, of course, it depends on n. It may depend on n and on epsilon, but as I already said, we don't care about the dependence on uh, either n or epsilon of this constant. Okay, so that's a very classical result. And here is a conjecture. So it says that if now, instead of uh, looking at the full class group of K, you look at the P torsion subgroup for fixed prime number P, then this time, uh, this uh, quantity should be, the cardinality of this group should be much, much smaller. And in particular, it should grow uh, more slowly than any power of uh, the absolute value of the discriminant, okay? So again, the constant here is, may depend on n, on p, on epsilon, but we don't care about these, uh, these de dependencies. Okay, so this conjecture was uh, first raised as a question rather than a conjecture by uh, Brumer and Silverman in 96. And then it appeared in the literature in different places in the 90s. So for instance, in the uh, work of Duke, and other people, and then it became uh, classical, but um, there were for some time absolutely no results close to, uh, close to this. So it became like a, a folklore problem, which is like really hard. Okay, uh, still there is of course one case for which uh, the conjecture is known. So by Gauss genus uh, theory, it's not hard to prove that in the case NP equals 2, 2. So you're looking at two torsion of quadratic fields. Then uh, you can bound the two torsion subgroups of quadratic fields by roughly the divisor function of the discriminant. So in particular, it's smaller than any power of, uh, of the discriminant. Okay, so that's the only case when the conjecture is known. Uh, and indeed, even proving that there is actually some saving for some fixed pair n and p, there is some delta n p positive such that for any number field k we have such a bound. So the p torsion subgroup, the cardinality of the p torsion subgroup, is less than uh, some power of the discriminant, which is less than one half. Then already this is very hard. Okay. Uh, but still, if we are ready to assume some uh, strong conjectures, then things can be done. So this is what Ellenberg and Venkatesh did uh, in 2007. So for any n, at least two, and p any prime number, they prove that if you assume GRH, then you get 
some savings. So in this case, delta NP will be uh, one over two P times N minus one. Okay, so why do they need GRH? Because um, they notice that if you have many small primes which uh, split completely in K, then uh, the quotient of the, the class group by its L torsion, it has to be somewhat big. So it means that the, the L torsion subgroup, it has to be smaller than, than just the trivial bound. Okay, so that's, that's what they do. And uh, so to prove this in general, the existence of such, uh, such uh, primes, I mean, many small primes which uh, split completely in K, they need an effective version of the, the Chibota density theorem. So that's why they need the GRH. Mm -hmm. uh, so apart from these conditional results, most results which are available are statistical in some sense, by which I mean uh, people have been looking at maybe the average of the, I don't know, the, the, the two torsion of a cubic field, say with bounded discriminants, or maybe they've been looking at higher moments and then deduce results uh, like um, for some pair N and P, uh, most number fields K which have bounded discriminant must satisfy some bound for which there is a saving. And sometimes the saving is uh, as good as uh, what we obtain with GRH. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse, it depends. Uh, but of course, uh, this, I mean, even this, even proving statistical results is hard because for uh, number fields of large degree, we don't even know how many number fields uh, have discriminant less than X, right? We don't know how, how to estimate this quantity as long as uh, n is at least uh, six, I believe. Okay, so so even statistical results are hard to obtain. So I had neither the courage nor the time to uh, display all the results that have been proved over the years. So I just displayed many names. I hope people won't be too mad at me for doing this. Um, so, of course, it started with uh, the work of Davenport and Heilborn in uh, the 70s. And then there were works, uh, works by Bhargava at the beginning of the years uh, 2000. And then many other people, so Heath Brown and Pierce, uh, Ellenberg, Pierce, Machet Wood, Frey and Widmer, Pierce, Turnage, Butterbuff, uh, Machet Wood, and more recently, Biglino. So, if uh, people are interested in uh, having like a complete or fairly complete list of works in the area. I recommend to go to the article by Pierce Turnage, but about in uh, Matchett Wood, they have a very, uh, I mean, it's like a survey of uh, everything which has been done in the area. You, know, you go to section seven of their paper. Okay, so I'll now move on to uh, unconditional pointwise results. Okay, so that's that's what I want to focus on today. So the first breakthrough in the area uh, was, uh, was done by Pierce in the years uh, 2005, 2006. So uh, she has two papers. So at the beginning, the saving was a bit less than the one I displayed there. And in the second paper, uh, she obtained that saving. So she's looking at the three torsion in class groups of quadratic fields. Okay, so n is equal to two, p is equal to three. And she proved that uh, we can get saving like, like what I displayed, so one over 56 in the exponent. And uh, to do this, she looked at some Diophant integration and she counted the, the, the integral points, I mean, the integral solutions of these, uh, of this Diophantin equation, uh, which, is, which is what we are going to do uh, later uh, today. Okay, uh, so this was uh, improved first by Hefgott Benkatesh um, by counting the solutions of the same Diophantin equation, but differently using their results in their uh, JAMS paper about integral points on elliptic curves. And finally, this was improved to uh, one over six by Enenberg and Venkatesh, uh, not using uh, a Diophantine equation, 
but using uh, the strategy I, I um, told you about before. So with uh, this time without assuming generates because that, that's some uh, specific case for which uh, this can be done. You can, you can prove that there are primes which do what they need. Okay. So uh, next, also, so using the same method, Ellenberg and Venkatesh look at the three torsion of cubic fields and they, uh, they obtain the same exponents, uh, the same savings of so one over six. And finally, they could also handle quartic fields. Uh, again, P is equal to three. Uh, but this time they didn't compute the saving, but at least for many number fields K, the saving delta that I displayed there is something like one over 168, I think. But in general, it's probably a bit smaller than this, but, but I mean, still, there is some delta positive such that for any quartic field K, we have this bound. Okay, so if we sum up, uh, we know a non-trivial non bound towards the conjecture in four cases. So NP is two, two, so two torsion of quadratic fields. And then P is always three, and we know it for n equals two, three, and four. So three torsion for quadratic fields, three torsion for cubic fields, and three torsion for quadratic fields. So there's four cases of pairs uh, NP such that uh, there is some step, some non-trivial step towards the conjunction. Okay, so this was the case until uh, the work by uh, Bhagava, Shankar, Taniguchi, Thorn, Zimmerman, and Zhao. So 2020 is the year of publication, but it was proved um, probably two or three years before. And for the first time, they could handle infinitely many cases. So from now on, P is gonna be two, always. Okay, and, um, and uh, but N can be just anything, okay? It's fixed but it can be as large as uh, we want. And they obtain the saving uh, one over two N in this case. Uh, and also, yes, so when N is equal to three or four, they have a refinement uh, of their approach, which gives them a much better saving. So it's the saving in this case is something like uh, 0.2215. So it's much better than uh, one over eight, say when, when N is equal to four. Okay, um, so today I'm going to focus on this case. So P is going to be equal to two all the time, but N is going to be at least five because the result is just too good when N is equal to three or four. And um, we just don't know how to, to get close to what they uh, achieved. Okay. Um, all right, so it's, Probably a good sign to stop and ask if there are questions from people in the audience. Okay, so if not, I'll just uh, continue. So I would like to go through uh, their proof. So I'm going to refer to their result by BSTTTZ. I hope they won't mind, but I mean, there's six, uh, six authors, so yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna need a lot of notation. So again, K is gonna be a number field. As usual, okay, is gonna be its ring of integers. Then I'm gonna let sigma one up to sigma R be the real embeddings of K and sigma r plus one to up to sigma r plus s are gonna be the complex embeddings of k. All right, so then uh, bold sigma is going to send k to r, uh, r to the n. Okay, so people call it the Minkowski embedding of k. So that's this map. So the first r coordinates are given by the sigma i's and then the next two s coordinates uh, are given by the real and imaginary, uh, imaginary parts of uh, sigma r plus one up to sigma r plus s. Okay, so we have r plus two times s uh, coordinates, so that's equal to n. Okay, so, so this map sends k to r to the n. And um, if we look at the image of the ring of integers of k, 
we uh, get a full rank uh, lattice in uh, R today. Okay, so I'm going to, sometimes people, sometimes people just uh, call this lattice in RN just okay. I mean, they denote it by okay still. Uh, I find it somewhat confusing in some situations, so I prefer to call it uh, LKs. Okay, so next I need to introduce the successive minima of uh, LK. So any notation for that. So uh, I guess it's uh, pretty standard to call them lambda i of LK. So lambda one, what is lambda one? Lambda one is the shortest non-zero vector in LK. Then lambda two is the shortest uh, vector in LK, which is not on the line uh, generated by uh, lambda one. Uh, I mean, some vector realizing lambda one. And then lambda three is the norm of, uh, the norm of some vector, which is in LK, but which is not in the plane generated by vectors realizing lambda one and lambda two. And we continue like that. So we, we end up with uh, N numbers, okay? So yeah, I should make this clear maybe. So lambda one up to lambda N, they are numbers. Maybe I said vectors, I mean, I meant norm of the vectors, okay? So they are positive numbers, okay? Um, yes, so this, uh, I mean, the, the, this equation is just one way to, to define them. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what I said. So in, in this notation, so I'm gonna call BN the Euclidean ball but I'm not sure I will use it again, but uh, I will use the Euclidean norm uh, quite often. Yes, so next, so in OK, there is a one, okay? So it means that when you send one to, R, uh, to Rn, you get some vector which is, uh, whose length depends only on n, okay, not on k. So it means that lambda one of Lk is some number which is bigger of one, okay? And uh, another thing to, important thing to note is that the determinant of this lattice, if you just apply the definition of the determinant, you get that it's almost the absolute value of the discriminant of K uh, with the square root, except that there is some factor, uh, we need to divide by two to the S where S is the number of complex endings of, uh, of K. But the determinant of K is essentially the square root of the, the discriminant of K. Okay, so it means, that uh, if you look at me, Minkowski's uh, second theorem, so it says that the product of all the successive minima, it's uh, bounded by some constant, which depends only on n times uh, the determinant of the lattice. So in our case, lambda one is one, so it just goes away. And the determinant of the lattice is essentially the square root of the discriminant, okay? So the, that constant two to the s goes away as well. So in this, uh, so we have two uh, equalities there. The left equality is just the Adamar inequality and the right inequality is really Minkowski's second theorem. Okay. Okay, so we'll start now uh, to go uh, through their proof. So here's the first uh, key lemma that they prove. So they prove that the cardinality of the two torsion of the class group of K, it's bounded by the pairs, the number of pairs Y and beta. So Y is gonna be some integer. Beta is gonna be in the ring of integers of K, such that we have two conditions. So uh, the Euclidean norm of the embedding of beta has to be bounded by DK to the one over N and uh, the norm of beta, so nk is the norm of k uh, of q, the norm of beta uh, has to be equal to y squared. So, so the, right, the right hand side is really the number of beta uh, whose norms are squares and which are small, I mean, which have small Euclidean norms. Okay, so how do they prove this? I'm not going to go through the proof today, but I'll just say a few words. So um, if you have uh, an, uh, an ideal class whose square is uh, trivial, that means that there is some ideal i such that i squared equals uh, its principal. So it's maybe equal to alpha times okay. But then whenever you multiply alpha 
by the square of an element of k, of a non zero element of k, then you're going to remain in the same ideal class. Okay, and what they do is that they choose this element. So we have something like, so we have alpha and we multiply it by the, the square of some element in k, maybe kappa. And they choose this kappa, uh, sorry, kappa, we multiply alpha by kappa squared, and they choose this kappa so that uh, the norm of beta is small, like smaller than what I wrote. Okay. Uh, and to do that, they use Minkowski's uh, first theorem. So they build up some, um, some uh, convex symmetric uh, body and they say, well, if the, the volume of this uh, body is, uh, is, uh, is, is large, which, which it is, then there must be some integral point, some, uh, yes, some point in some lattice, which is going to be kappa. And, um, and so that's how they can locate beta. I mean, the, the, that's how they can make sure that the Euclidean norms of beta, uh, the Euclidean norm of sigma of beta is small. Okay, uh, and of course, the norm of beta is a square because uh, beta times OK is going to be J squared for some ideal J. Okay, so, so, so that's, that's how the proof goes. So it's uh, fairly simple, but it's very clever. Uh, how are we uh, going to use this? So let's, um, let's take a basis omega 1, omega 2, omega n of OK such that omega one is one. And we have this uh, growth condition on the norms of sigma omega two, sigma omega n. And such that we have this condition. Okay, so such a basis exists. Some people call these uh, basis uh, reduced. Some of the people call them uh, minimal or almost orthogonal. They're all the same, they exist, and they satisfied these kind of properties. So if you look at a sum L1 omega 1 plus blah, blah, blah plus Ln omega n, then, uh, so usually when you do that, I mean, I mean maybe, maybe you will, if L1, L2, Ln, uh, I mean, may, maybe that thing is gonna be a very small vector and you won't have the property that I displayed, but when you select a minimal basis, this doesn't happen. Okay, so you, you, there's always a basis for which you can do that. Okay, um, then we get the following. So what have I done there? I have written beta as L1 omega 1 plus L2 omega 2 plus blah, blah, plus Ln omega n. Okay, because omega 1 omega 2 omega n is a basis of okay. So I have replaced beta by this in the norm. So that's fine. And then I had norm of sigma beta at most the absolute uh, value of the discriminant to the one over n. But now by using the second property, this becomes for any i in one n, li is at most decay to the one over n divided by the sigma of omega i. But by construction, these sigma of omega i, they have to be at least lambda i of lk, one i. So that's the bound that we get for the li's, okay? Uh, so maybe I should say that uh, BSTTTZ in their proof, they don't need all this notation, um, but that's gonna be useful for what we want to do after. So that, that's why I'm introducing this notation there. Um, but maybe that's just uh, our interpretation of their, of their proof. I and mean, they don't need the successive minima and, and all this mess, Very right. okay. All right, so next, <clears throat> so for any beta in okay, uh, so what's the norm of beta? So it's gonna be the product of the, the, the embeddings, right? So it's gonna be bounded by the Euclidean norm by definition of sigma of beta to the n. Okay, so I guess that's just the, the, uh, the how do you call it in English? Uh, uh, AGM, the arithmetic geometric means inequality. Uh, so we get this inequality for y. Right, if, if I go back, so I had y squared equals the norm, blah, blah. blah. So if the norm is at most uh, sigma of beta, you can norm to the n, then I get, uh, I get that y squared is at most decay. So y is at most the square root of decay. Okay. So then they use the Bombieri uh, pillar bound for discounting function. So we are counting the number of y and L1. 
such that y squared equals the norm of L1 omega 1 plus blah, blah, plus ln omega n. And y and L1 are in some uh, box, okay? So it's typically the, the, the kind of situations where you want to use the boundary fila bound. Um, so I have hidden some, a few things there because sometimes it can happen that for some choice of L2, L3, Ln, uh, the polynomial Nk of L1, omega 1, blah, 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 as a polynomial in L1, is gonna be a square, okay? So if you're in this situation, then the variety, uh, the curve you, you are looking at, it's not gonna be uh, irreducible. So you're gonna be in trouble, but there are very few choices of L2, L3, Ln for, this, for which this can happen. So in the end, it's fine, okay? But yeah, I have oversimplified a bit there. Um, so what do we get for the bounds? So the polynomial Nk of blah, blah, as a polynomial in L1, it has degree N. So y is bounded by dk to the one half. So we get dk to the one over two n in the exponent in the right-hand side, okay? This is the von Bier pila bound. Okay, uh, key lemma two. Uh, so it says that um, our lattices, lk, they cannot be just any lattices, okay? So in particular, the largest successive minimum of LK, it has to be smaller than uh, DK to the one over N. So of course, I mean, in general, if you take just a very, very a lattice with, with uh, I don't know, N minus one very small vectors, linear independent small vectors, and one very large, the next one very large, then sometimes it can happen that lambda N is about the same size as the discriminant of the lattice. But for lattices which come from number fields, this cannot happen. Okay, so why? Because um, so when so when we send OK to R n, we get a lattice. Okay, but uh, so that's a lattice because OK is a Z module. Good. But once we're there in R n, we have forgotten about the fact that OK uh, is actually a ring, right? In OK, you can multiply. You can multiply uh, elements and you, you still remain in okay. Okay, so by using this, you can prove that, um, they prove that lambda n has to be as small as uh, this. Um, and also it's a consequence of uh, Minkowski's second theorem. Okay, so key lemma one was a consequence of Minkowski's first theorem and key lemma two is a consequence of Minkowski's uh, second theorem. Okay. Um, Good, so what does it tell us? So what have we done? Uh, so far we have counted the number of Y and L1 satisfying our Diophantine equation, but now we need to sum over all the remaining uh, Li's. Okay, so we have L2, L3 up to Ln in some box. And what the lemma says is that uh, for each coordinate, the size of the box is at least one, okay? So it means that there is no coordinate for which uh, L, uh, let's say Ln has to be exactly zero and nothing else, okay? Because if that were the case, then we, we would be in trouble because we want to bound the number of, uh, uh, of possible Ln, say, uh, by uh, dk to the one over n divided by lambda n, but if these were very small, to the, if these were very small, very close to zero, then the number of ln would be only one, and that would be much larger than this uh, ratio. Okay. But since we have the key lemma two, we have this bound. Okay, uh, which is good because by Adamard inequality that I displayed uh, two slides ago, then this is exactly bounded above by the square root of the discriminant. Uh, minus one over n in the exponent, okay? Um, yes, and of course, uh, there is something that I didn't say and that I should have said. When you use the von Bieri pila bound, you get absolutely no dependence in the constant uh, on L2, L3, or Ln, and same, uh, no dependence on omega one, omega two, omega n. So it means that the constant that you, that you get in the von Bieri pila bound, the only dependence on k is in this power of the discriminant, nothing else, 
Okay, so now you can just multiply the two bounds that we got. So the number of y in L1 and the number of L2, L3, Ln, and you get a uh, half minus one over n plus one over two n. So that's a half minus one over two n, which is what they uh, prove. Okay, so that's that's the proof. Okay, um, any questions? Maybe about their proof. All right, so let me just uh, continue. So I'll continue with, uh, oh. there is a question. Uh, so does, does this work for the tor uh, torsion? Well, no, no, why? Because, um, so you see, let me just go back, uh, yes, there. Yes, there, so uh, there, if you drop, the condition that uh, the norm of beta has to be a square, if you just forget about it, then the number of beta in this set, uh, it's exactly the square root of the discriminant. Okay, so it means that even there, uh, you have already, uh, you recover Landau's with uh, epsilon equals uh, zero. Okay, however, if you look at the three torsion, say, then in this set of beta, I think you're gonna get that if you draw the condition that the norm of beta has to be a cube this time. So I'm looking at uh, p equals three now. So the norm of beta would be a cube. If I draw this condition, then the number of all possible betas, it's gonna be, I think, just dk and not square root of dk. So it means that to get some saving over uh, dk to the one half, you're gonna have to do, uh, you're gonna have to, to do something huge because you have uh, approximately dk possible betas, which satisfies some Diophantine equation. And by using this Diophantine equation, uh, you want a saving which is more than a half in the exponent. Okay, so that's just impossible. And there, there we got one over two n as saving. Okay, so hoping for one, a half in the saving is just completely crazy. So, so no, it doesn't work for higher primes. All right, so now uh, we'll uh, just continue. You're welcome. Um, yes, so uh, I'll talk about Salberger's uh, work now. Okay, so, um, so what did he do? So, <clears throat> so I learned about his work through uh, Tim Browning because last year I met Tim uh, at some point in the summer in Zurich and I told him that I had the idea to, to maybe improve upon uh, what BSTTTZ did by uh, not looking at, um, at integral points on a curve, but maybe by looking at integral points on, on surfaces and using some more general versions of the determinant method, the Bombieri pila method. And Tim stopped me and he told me, Per Salberger did exactly what, what you just told me. So, so for some time, I, I posed and uh, so I didn't know exactly what, uh, what uh, Salberger's results uh, were. Now I do. So I'm going to explain exactly, I'm going to state his result. Okay, so for this, I need notation. Um, so again, K is a number field and we're gonna let mu K be defined by this. Okay, so mu K is log of lambda two divided by log of the discriminant. Okay, so that's new notation. And uh, if you remember Minkowski's second theorem, so we had lambda two times lambda three times blah, blah, times lambda n is bounded above by the square root of the discriminant. But lambda two is the smallest of all the elements in this product. Okay, so there's n minus one of them. So it means that lambda two to the n minus one, it's at most uh, the square root of the discriminant. So it means that lambda two, I mean, the exponent of lambda two in the K it has to be at most a half of n minus one. I mean, one over two times n minus one, okay? All right, so we are going to need to keep that in mind uh, all the time. Okay, so here is uh, Salberger's results. So I wasn't so sure how to 
stated, but yeah, I mean, that, that's what it is. So it gets this exponent when mu k is less than one over two n. Okay, so that improves upon the BSTTTZ uh, results in the whole range mu k uh, between zero and uh, one over two n. Okay, so there's two ways to, to view uh, this improvement. So the optimistic way is to say, well, when n is large, one over two n is almost one over two times n minus one. So that's not so bad. And the pessimistic way is to say, well, for generic number fields, um, actually all the successive minima, they should be of the same size, right? So lambda two, it should be, for most number fields, it should really be very close to one, uh, one over two times n minus one. So, so in this case, this result is not gonna, is not gonna apply. Okay, so I'll give a very rough sketch of Salberger's proof. So what does he do? Instead of looking at integral points on affine curves, he looks at integral points on affine surfaces. Instead of using the boundary Pila method, he uses his uh, global determinant method. Okay, so I'm not giving any details. And again, I'm hiding a lot of stuff there because there are many surfaces for which, I mean, there are some surfaces for which the bound that I displayed there uh, will not be true or will not be provable. Uh, but then uh, in this case, one needs to prove that there are few surfaces for which this happens, okay? But I mean, I guess the outcome is really this, uh, this bound, okay? And um, so then you need to sum over all the remaining variables. And when you do that, you get the, the, the exponent that I displayed in his other result. Okay. So, and again, here, I mean, in the first uh, bound there, it's crucial that nothing depends, I mean, in the constant, nothing depends on the two and three LN or omega one, omega two, omega N. Okay. All right. Um, so, new bounds. So, here is a theorem. So, when N is at least five, uh, we have this bound, okay, so um, yes, so it's not so clear that it's, not only does it improve upon VSTTTZ, but it also improves upon Salberger's result in the whole range mu k in uh, 0, 1 over 2 n. Okay, so I drew some uh, plots, so that's in the case n equals 5, and the range of mu k is zero to one over 10. So I'm only displaying the range for which our result is uh, better than both results, but in the remaining range, one over 10, one over eight, the BSTTTZ uh, result is still uh, the best, okay? Um, so in these plots, the pink line is, corresponds to our result. The green, the mint uh, curve corresponds to Salberger's result, and the horizontal line black 0.4 is just a half minus one over 10. So that's the STTZ. TTTZ. Okay. All right. So, uh, how can we use this uh, result? Here is a corollary. Let's say you fix F, a number field which is not Q, then for any number field K of degree N, containing F, you get this new saving. So now you get two over three N as saving, which is much better than the one over two N from VSTTTZ. Uh, but in this case, of course, the constant may depend on uh, F, okay? Uh, but that's the idea. Let's say you're looking only at sextic fields, which, contains, uh, which contain Q adjoint square root two, then you're gonna get saving one over nine instead of the one over 12 coming from BSTTTZ. And the, the constant is going to depend on square root two, but that's, that's fine, I mean, you don't care about that, okay? All right, uh, so why is that? Yeah, because lambda two is gonna be bounded in terms of F only, okay? Uh, another corollary. Uh, so for any prime number Q, the two torsion in the class group of the field uh, Q adjoint uh, nth root of Q 
is going to be bounded by this. So here you get a ceiling which is two over three n, okay, which is much better than the one over two n we had before, uh, minus something, but something which is uh, which looks like one over n squared. So when n is large, this is going to be small, okay. So that's another example where you can where you can apply uh, our uh, result. Uh, okay, so where is that? Well, um, in K, there is Q to the one over N. So if you send it to uh, Rn using Sigma, and if you can compute Lambda two, you get this bound, but the discriminant it's, uh, is it computed? It's Q to the N minus one. So it means that Lambda two, it's really the discriminant to the one over N and minus one. Okay, so that's why we get a good save. All right, so uh, I'd like to say a few words about uh, our proof, but time is flying. Um, so we use the same strategy as Salberger, but instead of using the determinant method, we use some C, we use the square C, okay? Um, so for this, we use, so we, we consider the same counting function as we uh, had in Selberger's proof. Then we uh, smooth it because it's just uh, easier. And so what does the square sieve do? It, it's a tool to bound uh, sums like the sum in the, in the last line. So sum of omega of y squared when omega is uh, such, a, such, such a function like this one. Okay, so when you apply the square sieve, you find that our counting function is bounded by two terms. Uh, the first one is what it is. Okay, so, uh, so in this bound, P is a set of primes. I mean, curly P is a set of primes and uh, straight P is its uh, cardinality. Okay, but the second term, uh, you need to bound, you need to bound it. Um, and for this, I mean, it depends on exactly what it is, but uh, you need to, this is where the work actually is, right? Okay, but if you look at uh, this, and so I didn't say it, of course, M over PQ is the Jacobi symbol, okay? So if you look at this sum, and if you just use the definition of uh, our uh, smooth function, uh, our counting function uh, W there. So this is exactly what you get. Okay, so you get a smooth function times the Jacobi symbol where the, the what's upstairs in the Jacobi symbol is the norm of uh, L1 omega one plus L2 omega two plus blah, blah. Okay, and P and Q are fixed in this uh, calculation. Okay, and then you apply the Poisson summation formula and you get something like this, where, um, so Psi hat of course is the Fourier transform of Psi and T is a complicated exponential sum. Okay, so in this exponential sum, you have a Jacobi symbol with uh, the norm of alpha one omega one plus alpha two omega two, where alpha one and alpha two run over our modu uh, modulo PQ. And then you have some uh, exponential. Okay. So then the game is to bound the, uh, the exponential sum. And uh, for this, you need to find uh, an appropriate set of primes P for which you can bound the, uh, the exponential sum. Okay, so, I mean, I don't really have time to say anything about that, but we can do it. And we can prove that there is full square root consolidation in this exponential sum. So this, this, uh, this bounds is as good as uh, we can expect, okay. And uh, the outcome is as follows. So we get that the first term were in the first was just this. And then the second term, we get uh, P square. Okay, so then we uh, choose the best possible P, which is this. So we get this bound for the counting function. And then as in Salberger's proof, we sum over all the remaining variables. And there, of course, I didn't say it, but when you bound the exponential sum, 
There is no dependence. You remember we had NK of L1 omega 1 plus blah, blah, blah in the Jacobi symbol, but there is no dependence on uh, in the constant there. There is no dependence on omega 1, omega 2, or L3, L, L4, and L. Okay? So we can just multiply these two bounds and we get, uh, we get our theorem. Okay? All right, so that, that was a bit fast, but I didn't really have uh, time, so sorry for that. Uh, so further expectations. So what's, what's gonna be in this slide and the next one are not theorems yet, but we expect, uh, we expect the statements in these uh, two slides to be theorems uh, very soon, okay? So, so here is another, uh, not theorem, but statement. So we expect this to be true. Okay, so it's, you get a different exponent for dk and a different exponent for lambda two. Uh, and I'm claiming that this improves on all the other results in the range one over five n, one over two n minus one. So it means that it improves upon everything, even for the maximal possible value of mu k. Okay, so situation is like that now. So pink is what we had before. Black is still a BSTTTZ. And the, the blue there is uh, the new, not theorem, the new statement, okay? Um, again, what you see on the right of these three curves is that even for the maximal possible value, so this time uh, I've plotted uh, the three exponents in the range uh, zero, one over eight. So before I only considered the range zero, one over 10, because between one over 10 and one over eight, we couldn't beat BSTTTZ, but now we can beat uh, what they had even there. Okay, so, so in particular, we should be able to prove the following. Uh, so that's a new bound. In this statement, there is no lambda two anymore, which I just replaced lambda two by, by its maximal possible value given by uh, Minkowski's second theorem. And we get that. So remember, uh, BSTGTZ, they had uh, a saving which was one over two N. And there, if you look at the first term, we get minus 15 over 28 N. So that's minus one over two N minus one over 28 N. So that's always smaller than uh, what they had. Okay, so for instance, I mean, for, for N large, it's clear that it's gonna be better because the second term is in one over N squared, so it's gonna be small. But even when N is equal to five, we save something, we save one over 500 uh, something. Okay. Um, okay, so do I have maybe one minute to tell you? Uh, right, so I'm running out of time. So if you want to know uh, about uh, how the proof of this result should go, then uh, feel free to ask at the end. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks for your attention.